You may recognize this little room. Many of us have watched Sarah Boone be interviewed on this little room for almost two hours. Sarah Boone, a Florida woman who is facing a second degree murder charge, going to trial Monday, October 7th, sat in this room when she was interrogated for almost two hours. We have covered the full interrogation in this channel. Please check out the Sarah Boone playlist. We have uh, divided it in 30 minute sections so that we could analyze her behavior, her mannerisms and everything. And we're going to watch today the motion to suppress that her newest attorney, Mr. Owens, was heard on just this week, a few days ago, uh, kind of like as a last Hail Mary, a last resource, which would have been a huge win. He ideally was asking for this full interrogation, the two-hour interrogation to be suppressed, to not be part of the trial uh, so that they could present a defense for her because she spoke to the interrogators without any attorney, without any advice. She just talked and talked and talked. And he wanted to have that uh, interrogation not be a part of the trial. Unfortunately for Sarah, the judge denied the motion. The full interrogation is in. And Mr. Owens, the new defense attorney, made the best case he could make. And that's what we're going to watch tonight. It's important to note that Mr. Owens is her ninth attorney. Sarah Boone has had eight state-appointed attorneys, which didn't work out for some reason or another. Either they were fired by her or she fired or they gave up or she couldn't get along with them. She didn't appreciate their work ethics, whatever the case may have been. Uh, after the eighth state appointed attorney, the judge obligated Sarah to represent herself as a pro se defendant. And she tried. She started taking notes. She started speaking in her motions. And then she placed a crafty ad asking for an attorney to represent her pro bono uh, in exchange for notori notoriety or whatever, however you say that word. And Mr. Owens kindly uh, decided to represent Sarah, which is great for her. Everybody should have the right to counsel and to have a good attorney representing them. He did the best he could in this motion. Uh, but we're going to note that the judge he has been working on this case since 2020. He has heard from eight attorneys. He has heard from multiple letters that Sarah herself wrote to the judge complaining about him, about the attorneys, about everybody else during the whole four years. So the judge is not thrilled. And you're going to notice right away the demeanor that the judge is going to take. I would not want to be Sarah or I would not want to be Mr. Owens, her defense attorney in this case. So we're going to watch this motion, how it went and what we can kind of expect to be coming up this week when we start watching her trial. So here's the beginning of the case being called uh, by the Honorable Judge Michael Krenick. And I believe this sound okay, is faulty. Uh, William J for the state. At the court by all uh, feeds that I tried. So we we'll check one for bit. Sarah Boone. I do. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Boone, good afternoon. If you could please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me. Sarah Boone. 101077. Okay, we're here on several different matters, including a motion to su uh, suppress, specifically the motion to suppress defendant statements at OCSO filed September 24, 2024. The amended motion to suppress defendant statements at OSC or OCSO filed September 30, 2024. And then just what was filed this afternoon at 2.35 p.m., defendant's second amended motion to suppress defendant's statements at OCSO. Uh, State, have you had the opportunity to review the second amended motion? Are you ready to proceed on that today? Okay. Are there any housekeeping matters we need to address from the state side of the ledger? Not on that motion. Okay. Uh, any housekeeping matters on your side of the ledger, sir, with regard to those motions to suppress? No, sir, Judge. I believe we've got two detectives outside to testify, and we've also got the custodian of records from the Orange County Sheriff's Department relating to the Miranda card and the policy. Is that 
a valid argument that you're still embarking on this afternoon based on what's in your second amended motion? Yes. Okay, so the, the um, sufficiency of the Miranda waiver is still at play? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. Um, with regard to the other motions that were set for today, the, and I have reviewed the state's motion to strike, and I have reviewed all the case law authorities that y'all have provided to me as well. With regard to the defendant's motion for hair, cosmetics, civilian and clothing without restraints for trial, Mr. J, do you have any position with regard to the restraints at trial portion of that motion? I believe the law of the case has already been settled on that issue. That okay. was before right. she we'll had a new attorney, though. There. And I've also reviewed the state's request for protective order filed September 30, which is also set to be heard this afternoon. Uh, with that, uh, we'll begin with the motions to suppress. State, you can call your first witness. Judge, uh, I'm not objecting to the authenticity of whatever it is he subpoenaed. Whatever it is. Some of the documents, um, Orange County Sheriff's Office General Order uh, 711. Um, I don't see any need to belabor the, the custodian of records sitting around. Um, is there something else? Did you, is there actually a Miranda card? Or yeah, if you, if you, if you look uh, in the very back. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor's like, yeah, whatever, I saw it. You see the Miranda card, the last page, and the next to the last page. Yeah, there's no need to keep the custodian records around for authenticity. We still have our objections. Okay, all right. Can the custodian then be released by virtue of the state's stipulation as to that, uh, those records? Yes, can I be you? Yes. <clears throat> So the, the attorney is going to have an issue with the Miranda card, specifically the end of it when it says, did you understand the rights that I've read to you? And at this time, understanding them, do you wish to waive them and speak to me? That's the issue the defense attorney is having I also have with the Miranda the card. two hour and six minute um, investigation that's pertinent to, to the motion to suppress. The court has reviewed the entire video. With that state, you may proceed. I would uh, ask the court or the clerk to mark A for identification as a DVD, emergency copy, some body worn camera. I can't hear, you, sir. Let me. Okay, I'm going to fast forward to the detective's uh, testimony because that's what matters here. This is Detective Chelsea, and she's the one yeah, interrogated Sarah the in the little for room for almost two hours with her partner, Scott. C-H-E-L-S-E-Y. Last name is K-O-E-P-S-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. Counselor, your main court. Thank you. Where do you work, ma'am? The Orange County Sheriff's Office. And what do you do for Sheriff Mina? I am a homicide detective. How long have you been a homicide detective? What's your total experience with the Orange County Sheriff's Office in terms of years? Uh, I'm going on 12 years. Any prior law enforcement experience prior to joining uh, the Sheriff's Office? And in the homicide unit, how is it that you get notified that you shall so be So this the is the prosecution the asking her a few questions. Uh, so for this case specifically, my team was on call that week for homicides. And so on the scene, notify the call center to notify the on-call homicide. All right, and is it fair to say that you guys have three teams of four? Yes. And each of the third weeks you will be on call? Yes. And then through some other random distribution, it's determined who of the four will be the lead? Correct. And it was your turn to investigate the death of Jorge Torres? Yes. And you were notified of this on February 24th of 2020 in the afternoon? About what time were you notified? Um, I, I would have to look at the CAD sheet to recall directly, but I would assume within 30 minutes to an hour of deputies being on scene. All right, and do you go to the scene first or do you do anything else? Um, for this particular incident, I got my partner, Detective Scott Lowen, and uh, we headed out to the scene. All right, and when you got to the scene, what did you do? Uh, I met with um, the deputies there, 
and they kind of just briefed me on what was going on and what they responded to. Did you do a walk through of the scene? I did. And then was a search warrant drafted for the residents? And later okay, action. well, let's take a pause here and take a look at how that first encounter actually happened. So this is this detective, Detective Chelsea, arriving at the scene and her deputy had given her a little, you know, brief summary of what was going on. And let's see the first few minutes. Where's the volume? OK, there's no volume yet, but it's coming soon. There you go. Did you get enough water? Do no, I have to stand up safety, though? This is I don't want you getting lightheaded. So remember, I said I feel weird. are going to come out and talk to you and go from there. Very, very. You know in the very, very beginning, we're going to notice how Sarah Boone is all about herself. Okay, uh, she's just. Let's watch her comments, her own words, her demeanor. She just found her boyfriend dead. She knows he's dead inside the house. And the police is there to talk to her. And she's saying, do I have to stand up to talk to you? Uh, I feel dizzy. Uh, I feel weird. So it, it's about how I'm feeling, right? It's not about, oh, my God, what's going on? What's going to happen? Uh, anything, here, here. any concern for him? Questions and then go from there, okay? okay? All right. All right, Sarah, my name is Chelsea. My partner, Scott. Um, to my understanding, you reside here? Okay. Is it just you? Um, okay. Not anymore. Um, I'm try to turn it up. Okay. Um, but you reside here with George, and then your son lives with you, or lives there? It's 50 50. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, from what um, we love you guys. has told me, <laughs> um, she explained. Um, last night that you guys were drinking a bottle of wine. Um, One bottle. And around midnight, um, you decided you guys. Yeah. Okay. You guys decided to play hide and seek. Well, we were playing hide and seek, and then. <coughs> was your son home at the time, or no. okay? Just no. the two of them play hide and seek. Two of those just okay. play hide and seek, you know, um, like you do. Decided to play. We just did it like that, like. Sure. We were pet puzzles sure. together. Sure. We that makes sense. You can see the puzzle that we finished in there, and then the artwork, and then decided to play hide and seek, just being stupid. Okay. So he decided to get in the suitcase. So I thought it would be funny to, and he was laughing about it too, mm -hmm. to dip him up in there. Mm -hmm. I go upstairs. And Stop. Okay. So Stop. I, this afternoon, when I actually got. Stop him. right here. I'm gonna stop. This is what lack of self-awareness looks like, uh, lack of reading the room, you know. First few words, she tells this homicide detective. He got into the suitcase, and then I thought it would be funny to zip him up in there. Confession, confession, done, case closed. You zipped him up. He died as a result either intentional or unintentional, it is homicide. The victim has died uh, by the hands of another. It doesn't mean, oh, homicide doesn't mean that I intentionally planned and, and killed someone, but that someone died by the hands of another. So she just confessed right there, right? So now let's go back to the testimony that the detective is giving about the situation where she just arrived and what did she do? Did she like case the area? Did she do a walkthrough? Judy. What happened? Did you have any contact with somebody identified to you as Sarah Boone on the scene? The one that we just saw. Do you see Sarah Boone in courtroom today? I do. Can you point out where she is and what she's wearing? Uh, she's here on right my left. Right there. May the record reflect she's identified the defendant. Record will so reflect. When did you first have contact with her? Um, if I'm not mistaken, she was outside of the apartment when I got there. Um, so once I spoke with deputies, I then went and introduced myself to her. All right. And did you ask her any questions at this time as you guys are standing outside of the residence? Not like detailed questions about. I mean, like, Sarah just started talking. Was told by um, deputies what she had told them. 
Um, so it's more just to like introduce myself and to let her know, you know, we're doing a search warrant. And attorney, attorney, procedure. attorney. But no, Sarah just started talking right there. We do things. And when you respond to a scene, uh, do you respond in plain clothes? What? Uh, I do, yeah, like business professional. Like what you're wearing? Yes. And when you made contact with her outside of her residence for this first contact, um, were you alone or was your partner Scott Lowen with you? He was there. I believe Scott was with me. And was he also similarly dressed in business casual? Yes. And with a gun. Right. He had a big and so gun. how long was this initial interaction with Ms. Boom? Not long. Um, maybe a couple minutes to a few minutes. Okay. And this was out on the couple sidewalk minutes. in front of uh, her home? Um, yes, if I'm not mistaken, she was at a neighbor's residents like sitting out on their like front porch area do you call what you asked her in this initial contact do i recall what you asked her no okay come on you didn't so watch the video that you were there with her you know how many views this video has of sarah of the outside interview which actually she talked to her from let's see here from 25 minutes to about so she talked to her about almost 10 minutes okay this video of the outside interview portion has four million views and that's only uh at the law and crime channel so there could be a, there could be a lot more in the court tv and everything else and then she's telling us oh i didn't let me share the the right tab so she's telling us that she didn't like I'm not sure if I saw it. Like, I'm not sure if Scott was there with me. I'm not sure where she was. Come on, lady. You know, I, I think you've seen this video over and over again. We have. But okay, let's give her the benefit of the doubt. She's doing great. She's being pretty straightforward on the stand. And I mean, the truth, the facts are on her side, right? The detective uh, pretty much has done nothing wrong. So up to this point, we're just watching, we're observing here. So let's see what else she says. Yeah. Okay. And then what do you do after your first contact with her? Um, so once I did my walkthrough, we decided to go with a search warrant for the scene. Um, so that was written by somebody else. And then once that was executed, um, we went in there further with uh, CSIs. And then um, we talked to um, Brian Boone, which was the ex-husband. And yes. then um, I believe we then sat Sarah and went to, the, to our unmarked vehicle and had a conversation with her. Was that conversation in the unmarked vehicle recorded? Yes, audio recorded. And can you describe this unmarked vehicle for Audio, the okay. Um, at the time, I was in an unmarked Pathfinder, so it was like gray in color. Didn't look like it didn't say like law enforcement or police or anything on the exterior. Okay. Um, and there were lights like in the inside. Where did everybody sit in this Pathfinder? I sat in the driver's seat. Sarah sat in the front passenger seat, and Dr. Scott Lawrence sat in the back seat. Did you have any conversation with her about the facts of the case or your investigation that wasn't recorded inside the car? And that was all recorded and turned uh, over to the state attorney's office? Yes. And you announced the date and time of the start of this interview at, on that recording, did you not? Okay. Is it fair to say uh, that it had been about three or four hours since the initial call out for a 911? Yeah, I would say, yeah, because I believe we started interviewing her right before 5 p.m. And is there any particular reason for executing the search warrant and speaking to another witness or witnesses prior to interviewing Ms. Boone? Um, just based off the, the situation, what was happening. Okay. Is it in any way unusual uh, to gather evidence before talking to the last person to see a decedent alive? Um, at some point during this day, which was February 24th of 2020, uh, was her cellular phone device collected? It was. And when was that? That same day. I mean, when time-wise in, in relation to talking to her? Oh, um, well, I noticed the phone was in the kitchen area, um, but I didn't touch anything until CSI's um, documented everything 
photographs. And, um, so I don't think I really touched it until after I had talked to her about going through it. All right. And ultimately, uh, was she placed on arrest on February 24th, 2020? No. After she got out of her car, was uh, she free to remain on the scene or free to leave? Yeah. Not go back in her house. But yeah, to Prior to that, had she been detained and requested not to leave the scene? Right. One more time. Prior to your interview with her in the car, uh, had she been asked or ordered to stay on the scene? Uh, not by me. Okay, so let's uh, take a recap here and try to put ourselves in Sarah's position a little bit and try to understand what it was going, what was going on in her mind. Okay, so Sarah lives this life that apparently for her ex uh, ex husband and neighbors, she drinks consistently. Right, she might have an alcohol problem. She might be an alcoholic, although she has not admitted to that. Uh, what does that mean? For an alcoholic, somebody who has developed the addiction, the habit is so bad that they cannot break it. They may find themselves in situations where they black out. They might, they might find themselves in situations where they lose track of time, where they do things awake they have no idea they're doing after. They have no memory they're doing after to the point where people will wake up bruised and be like, how did I get this? How did I do this? Where's my car? And many things like that. So this is Sarah. She doesn't think she has a problem, but she doesn't work. She lives a life where she has a son. Sometimes the son is with her. Sometimes the son is with the ex-boyfriend, ex-husband. She's now living with George Torres, her boyfriend, who is trying to work here and there. They have issues, right? They have issues. They have have had called the police in the past due to domestic violence on both sides and both have been arrested. Sarah has been arrested in the past. George Torres have been arrested in the past. So they live in a situation where it's kind of like a ticking time bomb ready to explode at any time. Uh, Sarah thinks it's just another night. It's just a regular, normal night. And she keeps repeating that during her full interrogation, the two hour video where she just says, we were having a great time. It was, it was a good day. We were not having any problems lately. It was a good day for any normal person. It could not have been a good day, especially after what happened. When you look at, uh, you know, you're not going to say that. You're just going to say it was a terrible tragedy that happened that day. Uh, the day seemed normal, but no, she kept saying it was a good day. We were having a great time. So she's drinking a bottle of wine. Here is where the issue is for me already. If she has a habit with alcohol and she's drinking one bottle of wine and she is dividing this wine with her partner, I don't think she would have been blackout drunk. She wouldn't been to the point where she just doesn't even recall that she left him in a suitcase and goes to sleep, right? I think she definitely drank more than that. And that is typical for alcoholics to say, oh, I only had a glass. Or even when you go to your doctor, you'll be like, how much do you drink? Are you a drinker? I, you know, do you have a problem drinking? Well, I have like a glass once in a while when sometimes the person has like two, three bottles once in a while, you know? So I don't know if they were drinking a bottle or eight bottles of, of wine, but definitely i my perspective is that I do believe that they drank a lot. I believe that they were playing at one point. I believe that they were goofing off at one point. I do believe that he got into the suitcase. I do believe she zipped him up there and that she blacked out and that she went to sleep. She forgot about it. She woke up and was like, whoa, he's dead. But the problem here lies with the result and with the homicide detectives questioning her and asking her questions and taking her phone, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, and she doesn't realize she's in big trouble. She didn't hire an attorney. She didn't ask for an attorney. She just thinks that this is going to be considered an accident because she says so. So that is how we in this channel, uh, came to believe that Sarah might be, uh, someone with a narcissistic personality disorder where she's unable to see her faults to the point where she, her ego is so inflated and she thinks so highly of herself that she believed that she could talk her way out of the situation with this detective when she was being questioned. 
to the point where she didn't ask for an attorney, right? When she's questioned in the car and afterwards, the next day, when she's taken to the police station and questioned for two hours, she believes she can keep talking and they're going to believe her. So that is a sign of narcissism when you're unable to see your own faults. So uh, let's take a look at what else the detective has to say to the prosecutor here. Um, February 25th, was there a second interview uh, conducted with you and Detective That's the Long next day with, from the car interview, yes. okay. Prior to this interview, had her phone been extracted by any member of the digital forensics team at the sheriff's office? Yes, it has. All right, and had you reviewed some of the evidence on there? You had uh, requested that Ms. Boone come down to the sheriff's office rather than you returning to the scene? Yes. Can you explain that? Um, it's more of a controlled setting for law enforcement. Um, we're able to audio and video record at the sheriff's office. And um, she had mentioned that she might not be staying at her apartment. And so I didn't want to go to the ex-husband's residence where her potential child was. So I just well, you were sure going to arrest her that day, and you right. asked her to come. And to when Miss Boone arrives at the sheriff's office, um, who goes down to greet her and where? It was not me, um, but she would have gone in through. Um, we have two entryways, um, so either on the record side or um, on the opposite side. Um, and she would have to go up to the window and request that she was there to meet with me. They would call me. I would tell them, yes, sign her in. Um, and then if I'm not mistaken, I believe Scott, uh, Detective Lowen went down and got her. All right. So you're describing two separate entrances that members of the public can come and go through? Yes. As opposed to separate entrances that might be in the back of your building where people are not free to come in and out of without a swipe card. Yeah. Yeah, but Sarah was under the impression that she was there to pick up her phone, not to be arrested, not to go through an interview of two hours, right? And at this point, the the problem here, which the defense attorney is trying to bring, is that at this point, the next day, this detective had already gone through Sarah Boone's phone. The detective had found in the phone a video recording of the moment where George was zipped up into a suitcase and screaming for pleading Sarah to open up because he couldn't breathe. Sarah laughs at it and says, Haha, that's what you get for everything you put me through. And she's obviously drunk. Her voice sounds drunk. And, and he says, Sarah, Sarah, I can't breathe. She says, that's my name. Don't wear it out. So all of that is recorded and it was on her phone she didn't remember. That's why she willingly gave her phone to the detectives. And the next day, she doesn't even remember when the detectives start showing her that. So the detective the next day knew they were going to arrest Sarah. They knew about the video. They had the video and they were going to arrest Sarah. So instead of arresting Sarah two hours before, no, they interrogated Sarah for two hours. And at the end of that interview, that's when they arrested her. So that's why her defense attorney is just trying a Hail Mary here saying, listen, if she knew she was under arrest, she wasn't going, she wouldn't talk to you. She would have asked for an attorney. She didn't understand her rights and you guys are trying to trick her. Therefore, this should be thrown out, this full interrogation. But it wasn't successful, right? But still, we're here to watch how interesting this trial is about to be. Uh, by this latest motion. So let's see what else this, the right. prosecution has now, to point out. in relationship to those two entrances, which I assume are on the first floor of the building, is that a safe assumption? Yes. Where are the CID or the investigation division's interview rooms? They are located upstairs. All right. And um, is she allowed to just walk up to the second floor interview room or does she have to be with an employee of the sheriff's office? She would have to be with them. Little did Sarah know your those testimony were her is last you. three steps. The last time she freely tell us walked about these anywhere. interview rooms. This is four years ago, since 2020. We have four interview rooms that are audio and video recorded. Okay. And they have, you said they're video recorded. 
was the interview with Miss Boone video recorded by uh, the Sheriff's Office. Equipment. Yes, we've seen it. We was there all any seen conversation it. about the case or the investigation with her that did not occur inside that room with the recording going? No. Okay. I'm going to go to the questions of this witness. Thank you. All any right. Examination. Here comes defense attorney, yes. Mr. Owens. <clears throat> Detective, I'm James Owens. I met you outside Hi. just a few minutes ago, and you know, I, I represent Sarah Boone. Detective, have, have you had a chance to review any paperwork related to this case prior to this hearing? I have looked at my investigative report, and I have looked at some policies, but they were from current. Have you had a chance to view uh, Deputy Kayla Rodriguez's body cam video prior to today? I've seen it. I have not seen it recently. Have you had a chance to review and listen to the audio interrogation that was in the unmarked vehicle that you did of Sarah Boone on the day in question? Yes, I have reviewed that. So let's note, let's observe, right? We're here, we're mindful observers of the true crime body language. And let's observe her body language, her shift in body language, right? So far, when she arrived, she's very straightforward, very cooperative. You know, she knows there's a lot of good facts on her side that she has done uh, her job pretty much very well. And there are things that we can poke to, you know, to, to show that she could have done better to be perfect. But she definitely has done a lot. She has read Sarah Boone, her Miranda rights in the car before she asked her anything and the next day before she asked anything. However, and that's not even required because required, uh, the requirement is when two of the things happen, when you are under arrest and you're being going to be interrogated. So if you're just under arrest, they don't have to read your Miranda rights. And if you're just being questioned and you're free to go, they don't have to read your Miranda rights. So she has done, she has read the Miranda rights before, uh, you know, the day of the, the incident in the car and the next day in this little room. Uh, but we're going to notice that now she is, you know, she started friendly, a little smile. Yes. Hi. I, I remember you. Yeah, I know you. I know you're representing Sarah. How you doing, buddy? Hello. Great. And then she starts because he starts questioning her. Have you had time to review this, that? So she understands and her, her brain is now, you know, noting that this is an enemy. This is somebody that is going to be in front of her to attack her credibility, her work ethic. And it's not personal, obviously, because this, this is the only thing Mr. Owens can do to try to help his client. So sorry, lady, you're the one that is going to get it from him. Okay. So her body starts to show her face. It starts to show she has an eyebrow raise her, her, like, she's kind of like questioning, like, yeah, go ahead. Like, what is it? get it out. What is your question? You know, she's going to do a little bit of a lip pursing, you know, which women do a lot sometimes when they are, they have some type of disagreement. Uh, and her face is just going to start to show us the, that she's not happy about the questions that are coming out of Mr. Owen's mouth. And if you had a chance to review the approximate two hour uh, interrogation video at the Orange County. We Sheriff's have. Department. We yes. broke it down right here. Subscribe, like, share, leave a comment. Would it be fair to say that prior to you asking Sarah Boone to enter this unmarked vehicle for Can this you interrogation? Speak a little faster, sir. With Detective Lowen, uh, that why you, you did a preliminary investigation as to whether or not uh, this was potentially a homicide. No, they didn't tell her that. I don't yes. think. Oh, you did? And you would have viewed the scene inside the apartment? Yes. And you would have spoken to Deputy Rodriguez about oh, what I think she it's knew like, about the situation? Yes. She was and aware. You would speak to Deputy Rodriguez about what Sarah Boone had said had happened? So everybody knew it was going to be a homicide investigation there except about for Sarah. The I situation think. prior to speaking with Sarah Boone about the facts in this case. Uh, just Brian Boone. Okay. Correct. And was that conversation recorded with Brian Boone? Yes. And would that have been in your squad car? Potentially. 
Potentially. I didn't listen to that interview. Okay. I don't know if we interviewed him outside or in my car. Was he Mirandized? No. No. Okay. So although he was at the scene when y'all showed up, he was not considered a suspect or person of interest? No, he wasn't no. there when the guy died. At some point, did you determine that Sarah Boone was a suspect or person of interest? At some point, yes. Tell, tell us when that happened. Uh, the next day. Okay, so at the time of this event, your initial appearance there at the uh, at the scene, which I understand you you must have stayed four or five hours. Probably. Okay. Hard work. At, or... at no time did y'all consider Sarah Boone a suspect. Well, it's difficult to the way you're asking, but she was the only one there. She's claiming that no one else was there. So. And her first words were, her, "I zipped him up because um, I thought it would be would funny." Would mean that she was the only person of interest in that situation, but due to um, not having uh, the autopsy results, we just interviewed her initially, got her initial statement, and then pending once the autopsy was completed the next morning was when um, I already knew I was going to meet with her again to discuss the autopsy results. So then um, we had another interview with her where she was Mirandized and she went to jail later that evening. And while you were there on scene, I know at some point Watch her you saw her phone on the kitchen counter. I did. All right. Or and, maybe on the microwave. It was somewhere in the kitchen. All right. And at some point you Can went somebody to Sarah just Boone bring her mic a little lower. asked her for the password right to open the phone. We asked um, to go through her phone. Did you, did you ask Sarah How Boone, did you ask that? Can I have the password so I can go through your phone? Yes, after she signed the consent form. Okay, so not before? You didn't ask her before you asked her to the sign eyebrows. the consent form? Sarah, give me the password to your phone. Not that I recall, but why would I would normally have her sign the consent form first for her consenting to go into the phone I believe and her. gather the passcode or whatever it is. Well, how would that have even come about then? I mean, how would you have approached her I would like to look at your phone. Can you please sign this consent form consent and then unlock it for me? She called 911. So I told her that we needed to corroborate her story as to what occurred. Okay. And what does that have so to do with the phone? To do that, um, I wanted to go through her phone. What? Right, do you know about what time Come she John. Did you see that? signed the consent? Got away with it. No, I don't think it requires a time on there. But it was when we were on the scene initially. Was it prior to her interrogation in the unmarked vehicle? And after uh, she signed the consent, did you, your your testimony is you you asked her for her password and she gave you her password after signing the consent to search the phone? Yes, I didn't touch the phone until my digital team. All right, uh, you talking about her. the digital investigator, the forensic person to look at the and phone, and they have the ability to open up the phone and search the phone with or without a password. Yes, but. Y'all utilized the password that Sarah had given, had you not? I believe so. Okay. And do you know how long it took for the digital investigator to show up after you arrived? Oh, yeah. She didn't come until later. Um, I believe around 7 p.m. Okay. That's when in the CAD sheet she arrived. And you know there were two, two videos on Sarah's phone. After I spoke to Sarah. I'm sorry? After I spoke to Sarah. All right, so what, I, what I'm gathering from what you just said is um, at some point you asked or directed Sarah Boone into your unmarked vehicle where you interrogated her. Is that correct? Where we completed an interview, yes, sir. Watch the emphasis, right, of his wording, his choices of word. Unmarked vehicle where you interrogated her. And then she quickly corrects him where we like talk to her or however she just said. Her testimony it. is that you did not view the videos that were found on her phone. And I'm, I'm referring to the two minute video. Yeah, we know the George video you're talking case. about, sir. And then some time went by and I think there was about a 22 second uh, video of George in the suitcase that Trying Sarah took to of him in the suitcase. Yeah. Your testimony is prior to you putting her in your unmarked vehicle that you did not you were not aware of those two videos. That's correct, sir. I did not go through her phone until digital forensics came out 
and then went into her phone, and then she brought me over to her van to tell me about the, the videos and what she found. All right, so your testimony is at the time that uh, Sarah Ben was interviewed in your vehicle, that the forensic phone investigator had not arrived? Correct. Okay. Did you tell Sarah, I know we saw the audio once you get in the car, but did you talk to Sarah before y'all got in the vehicle? Of course. And did you tell Sarah that y'all wanted to talk to her and this was routine protocol? Yeah, that I wanted to have a conversation with her. And once, the, once I had walked through the house and saw what I was working with, we would have that conversation. Did you tell her that interviewing her in the squad car was routine protocol to your investigation? <laughs> I don't first thing. I specifically said that, sir. This is 2020. Okay. If she recalled that, would you dispute it? Objection, improper question. If Same. she recalled that. Your, your testimony is you don't remember saying that. I don't remember specifically saying what one more time. What is it that she claimed that I said? Ooh. Routine protocol. I would not interview her, not in my unmarked car. So my routine protocol, sure, I would do that. I would okay. interview her in a spot where no one can hear us. And you would explain to her why. Her, now her face is really showing some attitude, right? But a lot has happened in her face uh, as these questions have progressed so far. She did something like while he was talking, which is like a complete mouth grooming uh, pacifying behavior, sign of nervousness, uh, but almost like a sign of aggression, a sign of anger as well. When we're angry, we tend to um, like do a chin jut, pronounce ourselves, our face kind of like in an attack mode. We're not retracting, we're not defending, we're not protecting, we're more open. And that's what she's displaying here. The more and the more that the, the questions happen, she continues to respond with very, uh, clarity and also kind of with like an attitude, like, yes, sir. Like I saw what I was working with and I talked to her in the car and look at her face here, like completely startled. Like, how are you asking me any of this? Um, you were doing that, wouldn't you? Would I explain to her why we were sitting in my car? Yeah. Stand? Yes. Her eyebrows and her forehead, just display confusion uh, because she's thinking, why would I need to answer? Why would I need to explain to Sarah why we're, we were in our car, in my car? Uh, there's nothing wrong with me asking her questions. There's nothing wrong with me uh, talking to her, being the only witness to somebody's death, right? So the homicide detec detective here is just like acting like surprised with his questions. She's like, would I, would I tell her why we were there? Probably not. Like, I don't have to, sir. What are you trying to say here? No. Well, you would have to tell her something. No. I said, yes, we're going to go have a conversation in my car now. Now, okay. she did something and here did uh, that is very, was very pronounced. She went like one shoulder, which is a sign of lying. We don't usually like to say people are lying because, uh, you know, body language is a very complex subject. But when people do one shoulder shrug is very incoherent for the brain. We're used to going like, I don't know, I don't know, two shoulders go up. One shoulder went up when she said uh, that she didn't, you know, that whatever she just said. Let me let me see if I can go back here and check. No one can hear us. And you would explain to her why wait, you were wait, doing wait, that. Wait, 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 wait. Let me make this screen. Okay. And you would explain to her why you were doing it, why you were bringing her to the car so that nobody could hear it. That's what the question was. Would I explain to her why we were sitting in my car? Yeah. Stand? Yes. No. Well, you would have to tell her something. I said, yes, we're going to go have a conversation. See, in you would have to tell her something. Yeah. I said, yes. We're going to have a conversation in my car. So she probably didn't do that exactly. She probably, you know, said we have to talk. Uh, we have to sit here. Uh, she didn't say exactly the way she's explaining to the attorney now uh, because of her one shoulder shrug. But still no big deal. I mean, if Sarah willingly went and didn't say, no, I'm not going to talk to you. I want an attorney. 
then the detective did nothing wrong. No. Okay. And did she have any questions? Well, you, you heard what she just said. We're going to go talk in my car now. So it's kind of like an order, not a request, right? And police, because they do have authority, they are authority figures. Uh, it's very hard for people, for civilians to contradict the police. So to know our rights, right? So when somebody is the homicide detective saying, we're going to go talk in my car now. It sounds like we're going to go talk in your car now. It doesn't sound like this is an option. It doesn't sound like I, I can say, I, I'm not comfortable talking to you. Can I have an attorney? Like, it just doesn't sound like that. And, and Sarah's completely lost. She's hangover. You know, she's hungover. <laughs> she's hangover. She's hungover. She doesn't know what's going on. She thinks it was an accident and therefore it's okay. And she doesn't realize she's looking at life in prison and she's just like, okay, we're going to go talk in a car. We're going to go talk in a car. Let's go. Potentially explain to her that this is routine. It was all explained on the audio recording. Okay. But you, you agree you had a conversation with her before you got into the car with her. Yes. I definitely directed her to get into the front passenger seat when we were going to talk in the vehicle. Yes. Okay. And you, and you don't recall whether or not you said this is routine protocol to come into the car and talk to me those words specifically no okay. but i would have talked to her in the vehicle regardless i would not have talked to her outside of my vehicle right. now, so you already said how car, you, you said were, we're gonna go talk in my car now blowing. okay and you read her the miranda rights card correct yes from my card do you do you agree that you didn't you didn't ask her the last question number nine objection relevance response judge we're here on a hearing on on the issue about the interrogation but, but, of the case law that you provided to me none of it stands for the proposition miranda identifies the four things that need to be addressed not one of the case not one of the cases talks about that issue of reading that language at the bottom of the card that is in the motion upon information and belief this is what it says so how is it relevant for the purposes Whoa. of today well, it's, it's relevant because this is the policy of her department. But Judge, what, what is the policy? Ha but now we're getting away from the card to now the policy. There's nothing about the policy right now. The question is about what the card says. Okay. The card is the policy, and the policy is the policy. They're intertwined. Uh, they refer to each other. Um, our argument is that she did not waive her rights. But that's, a, silent. but that's a different issue than what is on the card. I understand, but it's a coercive question about her not doing that, which was the policy of her sheriff's department. She elected not to do that. She wanted a statement from Sarah Boone at the scene. She wanted a statement from Sarah Boone at the sheriff's department. She elected not to answer a question that the policy says read verbatim from the card. Why did she not want it? Our position is it was an attempt by this detective Whoa. to force Sarah Boone into talking. On February 24th or on February 25th? On February 25th. This, this interrogation ties into that one. She used the same routine protocol that she used for the second one. The first one, she claims that my client wasn't a suspect, wasn't a person of interest. At the sheriff's department, I'm sure, I haven't talked to her about it yet, but I'm sure she's going to say, yes, she was a suspect. Yes, she was a person of interest. Yes, we had probable cause to arrest her prior to her giving a statement. But what she said in terms of routine protocol the day before was what Sarah was relying on when she said routine protocol, when she questioned the detective about routine protocol the very next day in the interrogation room. And for her not to give... <laughs> That question goes to the totality of the circumstances as to whether or not my client, Sarah Boone, actually waived her right to remain silent. If she understood her rights, and then she consciously and freely waived her rights. She was not asked that question. She was not asked that question in the car. She was not asked that question. But that totality of the circumstances comes into play for the court to consider, this court or an appellate court to consider, as to whether or not that statement should be suppressed. Let's take a pause here real quick so that we can kind of digest what's going on, uh, what they're talking about. So 
the Miranda, the Miranda card, let me share this screen. The Miranda card uh, is giving the person the right, right? You have the right to remain silent. Uh, you have the right to talk to an attorney. If you cannot afford one attorney, one will be appointed to you. Let me see how that is showing up. It's not showing up very, very well. Let me try this one then. Here you go. Uh, if you cannot afford one, one will be provided to you. And then after you, you know, you have, I think there's more because I cannot find the one that they keep talking about with nine questions. I found five questions. But the main thing that they are discussing is the two last questions. Do you understand the rights I have just read to you? Yes or no. And then with these rights in mind, do you still wish to speak to me? And that's what uh, he keeps saying that she didn't fully understand, that she wasn't aware that this was going to be an interrogation, that she could be in trouble for a homicide. She thought it was protocol. She thought she had to talk to the, the detective. And the detective said, this is protocol. You know, we're just going to go over here and sit in my car now. So it's a very delicate thing. But the judge has zero tolerance for this case. The judge has sat in this court for four years. And at this point, I would have, if I were the defense attorney, probably asked for another judge just, you know, for appellate reasons, whatever the case may be. And the defense attorney is saying, oh, for appellate reasons, kind of like a, a sting, you know, a, a threat, a little threat. Uh, if you don't, if you don't give us what we want, judge, the appellate court might. Um, and this judge is just, he's not hearing it. He's not going to hear it. And I think Mr. Owens is going to have a really hard time during the trial with the judge because of Sarah Boone's past behavior, because of her eight attorneys, because of all the letters she wrote, because of all the complaints she had about everybody that was involved in this case. And the judge has shown her leniency. He has shown her patience. He has uh, collaborated with her, with her, but I think he has zero tolerance at this point. At this time, he no longer wants to help in any way. And he doesn't even... He shouldn't even be arguing with the attorney, right, with the defense attorney, but the judge is going to argue with the defense attorney. He's supposed to be like, prosecution, do you have anything to say in response? Defense attorney, do you have to say anything in response? And then this is my decision based on what you both just present to the court. But no, the judge is going to start arguing with Mr. Owens, the defense attorney, because he's just had it. He's had it. So I don't blame him, but if I was a defense, I would have probably asked for another judge. So let's see this response here after the attorney has displayed his concerns about the Miranda card and the last two questions. Let's see how the judge is going to react. Any other response? Judge, there you go. just like it's irrelevant what the sheriff's office policy is compared to what the Florida the case law. says about our right to not be compelled to give statements under our constitution in the state of Florida or the United States and federal case law and the state case law interpreting the United States Constitution, the policy is irrelevant and the officer's subjective intent is completely irrelevant in a motion to suppress, just like it would be in a traffic stop under Wren versus United States. What matters is objectively what was spoken to the defendant. And I would ask that we honor the local administrative order and call people by their surnames and not their first names. Whoa. Um, the defense attorney is like, what, what? And he took his glasses off because he called her Sarah. read what the case law requires. Anything about the policy, anything about the officer's subjective intent is completely outside of all the case law submitted by both the parties. Last bite at the apple. I'm sorry. Last bite at the apple. Last bite, Last at, the bite apple, at the apple, sir. We're, we're talking about the totality of the circumstances, whether it was coerced or not. Well, you can take any technique or a non-technique, something that you use or don't use to establish whether or not it was coerced or not. The fact that she didn't read, do you understand the rights? Do you understand these rights, which is the form, the Miranda warning form? Do you wish to talk to us at any time? That's, that's on the waiver affidavit. On the other form, which is the policies form, 
It says, do you understand these rights? And then the question number nine, do you wish to talk to us at this time? Objections overruled. Thank you. <laughs> and you're referring by surname. What do you mean by that? You mean? Uh... That, that means last name. Okay. What, what did I say? Did this detect? You call Sarah. the defendant by her first name. All right. Can I say Sarah Boone? Either Miss Boone or Sarah Boone. That's okay. fine. You may proceed. <laughs> Prosecution. Have you had a chance to look at the standardized Miranda card issued by the Orange County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Do you agree that you did not read the nine questions to her in your squad car? All nine questions? Is Correct. Nine? Yeah, it's all nine. No, I did not read all nine questions. Do you know how many questions you did read to her? Eight. Okay. And the... The question you omitted, omitted is question number nine. Is that correct? Look at her eyes. Yes, omitted? Like, card, are you accusing me of I'm something? Sorry? It's not on my Miranda card. It's not on her Miranda card. What, what do you mean by that? It was the card that you read. It was not on the card? Oh, he's going to make a big deal out of this. Miranda cards at the sheriff's office. But yes, that is the policy. In reference to the policy, yes, that is the policy. I got to find this Miranda well, with nine Somebody dropped the ball somewhere. Did you, did you fail to get... Sustained. Did, did you fail failed to get the someone. most updated card? Or how did that happen, that the ninth question was not on your Miranda rights card? I've had that card since I started being convicted in sex crimes in 2013. Have, have you become aware, as it relates to following this motion i've become more aware yes okay. there is that card. have you gone and gotten the updated card no objection relevance sustained why is it sustained it is the relevance is that we are talking about the nine questions so why is it sustained we want to know why this detective doesn't have the updated miranda card i mean there's nothing wrong with this question i don't understand that the sustained i don't understand <clears throat> If there's an update, why don't you have the updated one? When y'all took her phone, detective, did you tell Sarah Boone that you would be returning to her apartment the following afternoon to give her her phone back? No. You did not tell her that? No. But Sarah said you did. That's been audio recorded? No, I did not tell her that. We had plans to meet at the sheriff's office. Or tell me what you understood uh, the conversation was as it relates to her getting her phone back. I'm sure she asked when she'd be getting her phone back, and I didn't give her a detailed timeline. I said that, um, I don't even know if I told her that we, I decided to write a search warrant on it because I don't need to tell her that. It's evidence in a crime. I'm allowed to take it, and so I took it. I Ooh. Wrote a search warrant for it. Okay. But you don't recall ever having a discussion with Sarah Boone about when you were going to return her phone. Specifically returning her phone, no. Okay. And now she's in aggression mode. You later that evening. No more on pleasantly your cell phone. pleasant body language. She's just like you're attacking um, my character and my work ethic. Phone? I'm going to attack you right back, sir. You don't recall that conversation? She called you later that evening. Do you have documentation of the phone call? No. I have her testimony. Oh, whatever. That doesn't mean anything. I don't oh, okay. Excuse me? I do not recall the phone conversation. And maybe Sarah could you be lying. You said that y'all had some discussions about Sarah Boone coming to the station. Was that talked about the day of this event or the next day with Sarah Boone? Full we change up. All right. And did you relate to Sarah Boone oh, that... She needed to come to the sheriff's Eyes department narrowing. the next day to retrieve her phone? I don't know if I specifically told her about retrieving her phone, but she knew that I was waiting to hear about the autopsy results and that I would probably have more questions. All right, so you, you, you believe you told her that night, I need you to come back, maybe or maybe not about the phone, but I, I may have some more questions for you? Something along those lines, yeah. Okay. And when was it that you actually saw the two videos from Sarah's phone? Was it that evening after the interrogation in the squad car? I've heard the answer, but yes, it was after the 
I've already uh, answered. Was it while you were on scene? Correct. Okay. And did you attempt to talk to Sarah again about that at that time? Yeah. Okay. And so let's do something here real quick. Let's see her 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 facial micro expressions, right? Wait. I don't know if I specifically told her about retrieving her phone, but she knew that I was waiting to hear about the autopsy results and that I would probably have more questions. All right. So you, you, you believe you told her that night, I need you to come back maybe, or maybe not about the phone, but I just let's observe how she's breathing now, right? She's breathing like very, uh, fully and deeply, uh, because she is stressed. She's stressed because she's under attack. That's normal. I may have some more questions for you. Something along those lines. Yeah. Okay. And when was it that you actually saw the two videos from Sarah's phone? Was it that evening after? Okay. So this, when he asked, when was it that you saw the, this video? She's going to say, I already answered. And then she's going to do a mouth grooming, tongue judge. She's going to do all kinds of things. Her the face. interrogation in the squad Right now, car. she's trying to pacify her face. Yes, it was after the interview. All right. And was it while you were on scene? Correct. Okay. And did you attempt to talk to Sarah again about that at that time? Yeah. Okay. And so did you let your detective uh, partner know about the, the videos on Sarah's phone? Check them out, please. That, okay, so did you let, let's, let's check this question. Did you let your partner know about the videos, right? Which means the partner would be aware, listen, she's a main suspect now, like did, was he aware? So the objection is relevance. I think it's all relevant for the defense because the defense is trying to prove that the interrogation was under false pretenses and that Sarah didn't understand she was waiving her rights completely. So if she knew about the video, but her partner didn't, but if her partner didn't, he also didn't, you know, they also decided not to arrest her in the beginning of that interview instead of the end of the interview. So uh, if it was another judge, maybe he would find it relevant. But this judge is probably going to sustain. Overall. Oh, there did you go. Did you let your I'm partner wrong. know about Sorry. that evidence? Okay. And did y'all discuss that I take that it issue? back. Everything I just said. Relevance work product. Sustained. Okay. Uh, I missed that At one. some point, y'all had to... Were, were y'all working together, or were you making all the calls, or were y'all making joint boss? decisions? Sustained. Why is that sustained? We want to know who the boss is. Ma'am? There's no, there's no pending no, question at this time. No, sustained. Defense attorney, wake at up. At some point, did you form an opinion as to yes. whether you had probable cause? Yes. When I saw the video, yes. She was the murderer. Overruled. Yes, at some point I did. Yes, did yes. Did you make that decision by yourself, or was it collectively made by others with the department? Sustained. I make decisions all by myself, sir. You don't need to answer. Anything. You don't need to answer. It was sustained. Detective, at what point um, did y'all that next day? I think you you had her coming in in the afternoon. I believe it was around three p.m. Yes, yeah, Sarah doesn't work do Did y'all on trying mornings. to get the search warrant okay. for the phone? I got the search warrant for the phone, and I believe I got I submitted it that evening. I would have to look at it. So. Okay. Do you know what time the search warrant came back signed by the judge? No. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you you told Sarah to come in right. that, later that afternoon or the next day? Yes. Okay. And would it be fair to say like that this. you worked yes. on the case that entire day until Sarah Boone came in? Uh, yes, I attended an autopsy in the morning. That's why I asked her to come in at night. Hard right. work. What time was man. the autopsy that was morning? in the autopsy? Starts at eight, but I didn't probably get till ten. It takes quite. Two hours okay. she had and to were watch you the there alone with the medical examiner or was there anybody else there? Um, I don't recall if Detective Lone was with me or not, but yes, of course, there's doctors there. Okay. And so... <laughs> it's like, of course, I don't, I don't do the autopsy. I'm not a doctor. Your, your determination mm -hmm. as to whether or not Sarah Boone was a suspect... Did she become a suspect after you watched the video... The two yes. videos from her phone the day before the autopsy? Objection relevance. The 
custody is not disputed on the February 25th statement. How is this relevant? If the issue is knowing an intelligent waiver, the sufficiency of Miranda and coercion, what does the formulation of probable cause have anything to do with anything? Well, I, I wanted to bring out the fact that He's so annoyed. They had already made a decision before she came in for the interrogation on the 25th that they had probable cause to arrest her. So that if she, A, either didn't come in, they were going to go arrest her that day. They were, yeah. Or B, if she did come in Why and didn't she exercised her right or invoked her rights to remain silent, that they were going to arrest her anyway. They, they were? had already made a decision that she was the prime suspect. They had probable cause. What does cause. that have to do with any of the three issues that are raised in the motions? It's, it's whether or not she was in custodial interrogation, whether she was free to leave. I don't know that that's being disputed by the state. I think my response. That's my understanding. The state's okay. not disputing that there was a custodial interrogation, which is why over, on February 25th, which is why Miranda was provided. She didn't Prior know to that. that. No. Judge, it was provided the day before, and she's just testified uh, she was free to leave at any time. Right. Okay. So the Miranda and was then, so the detective talked to her in the car the day before, okay? Uh, and she said, we got to talk to you. We're going to go in my car. I'm going to talk. Here are your Miranda rights. It's protocol. I have to read it to you. Okay, great. The next day, when the detective knew she was going to arrest Sarah because she had the video, she had probable cause, she knew Sarah wasn't leaving that little room. She said, we're going to talk. We just have to talk. Here are your Miranda rights. We just have to talk. We just have to. And then she had Sarah talk for two hours. So I think the defense attorney has a point here, but nobody wants to hear him because Sarah Boone annoyed the crap out of everybody for four years. Given on two separate occasions, she wasn't in custodial interrogation. She was not in custodial. Right? Well, hang on. Before we ask any questions, let's chill with the, the evidentiary objection first. Okay. The objection sustained. Okay. You may proceed. Talk, Talk. to the hand. <clears throat> Ma'am, you would agree that Judge, you don't uh, need when to Sarah be, Boone arrived that you afternoon. Know, you don't need to attack Mr. Owens, who just is trying his best to work for free on behalf of this defendant. Judge, he's making your life easier because if you had Sarah pro, bo pro bono, pro, pro bono, if you had Sarah defend herself pro, pro se, uh, you would have a hard time, Judge, because your patience would go out of the window. So please be nice to Mr. Owens because he's making your life a little bit easier by trying to follow the rules of evidence, by having a, a bar license. And let's just show For the interrogation, the she was not free to leave. She was not free She's Excuse not me? going to be, but you never told her she was not free to leave. Okay. Let's take a look at the beginning of this interrogation. She was She was not going to be free to leave. But she was led to believe that this was going to be protocol, that she, just like yesterday, she was going to be free to leave. I'm going to have you sit. I'm going to have you sit in the green chair. Those were the first words. Let's see if she says, you are under custody, you are arrested, you're not free to leave. This is a custodial interrogation. <laughs> Appreciate you coming in. Yes, ma'am. So I appreciate okay. you coming in. So she's saying a few things before she reads her rights. And notice how an interrogation room is set up, right? They corner you in, you sit in the little corner. So whenever this is the position that you're in, call an attorney right away. You're about to be in some big trouble. I'm gonna ask about these room. We have a moment. Sure. Um, so obviously. Um, oh, she says, I want to ask you some questions when you have a moment. The detective says, sure. We received his autopsy. We received so, his autopsy. I'm going to read you your rights. I'm going to read your rights, but before she does that. Again, because I, we have to talk about that. I'm going to read your rights because we have to talk about that. Do you have to talk to an interrogator? No, you have the right to remain silent. And since I'm talking about the incident... We just have to do it, just, just like, like we did yesterday. Protocol. Just like we did yesterday. We just have to do it. And then Sarah says, oh, it's like protocol. Just like yesterday, we just have to do it. But what happened yesterday? Sarah was free to leave. And that is what the defense attorney is trying to point out to the judge here. 
Yes, she was going to be in custody. Yes, they were going to arrest her. Yes, they had probable cause, but she was not aware of that. And would that have changed? And I believe that the answer is yes, because when Sarah is actually arrested, at the end of the, the interview, when she's uh, arrested, the first thing she's going to say is call Brian, call Brian, because she's going to be asking for help. So let me show you guys her reaction when they actually arrest her as opposed to her reaction when she's just being questioned and she thinks it's protocol just like yesterday she's going to be free to leave that's her question to the best of my knowledge to the best of your so knowledge. here's Everything when she's I actually going to be arrested true and accurate to the best of your knowledge yes but it was not intentional so she keeps talking about not intentional she thinks she's free to leave just like yesterday <laughs> protocol right, me if I were there you up. go <laughs> Just turn around, face the wall. Now, if they had done this two hours right. ago, in pockets that I should know about. what would Sarah have said? Okay. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Because George is dead. Not intentionally. That doesn't we matter, understand. Sarah. Still dead. That's why second degree not well, first. Someone really needs to call Brian. Please. Someone needs to call Brian. Okay. Or can I not make a phone call? You'll can I make a make phone, phone call? call? When we get you down to the jail. Look how Why fast. Is so this was a trick. This is a trick. Look how fast that happened. Okay. How fast did Sarah say, I need to make a phone call? So if the attorneys had arrested her before they did this full, hour, full two hours interview, Sarah probably would have said, I don't want to talk to you. I want to make a phone call. So this is what the defense attorney, Mr. Owens, is trying to fight during this motion that was denied when, uh, when he's saying, listen, she did not know she was under custody. The police did. So at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the appellate courts or of whether this is allowed or not, whether the detective is allowed to wait until the end of the interrogation to then place the person in custody. So that's going to be an interesting question uh, to revisit. So let's go back to the motion. And so if if she would have remained silent and exercised or invoked her right to remain silent, Wanted she would a have phone been arrested call anyway. right away. And that was based on your investigation that you had the night before at the scene. And it was based on her statements that she had given you in the squad car. And, and it was based on the autopsy the that was performed the next day that you were present for. And it was based on the two videotapes that you saw from Sarah's phone. Yes. Infection relevance as to what the problem cause basis sustained. Uh, you had all that okay. information before you began your interrogation on Correct. the 25th of Sarah Boone. I had all that information. The one that I just All the information described. that I just related to you before before you began your interrogation of Sarah you Boone. did. On February 25th? Yes. That's correct. Yes. And you would agree that you wanted to speak to her on the 25th? Objection. Relevance. Why? Overall. Good. Uh, yes. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you wanted to get statements from her relating to the injuries to George Torres from the autopsy? Fair to say, yes. Relevance. Because it is a question she asked during the interview. The judge's like, uh, yes. I don't know. Conversation in reference to what she told me the night before and in reference to the injuries that she failed to mention. And you also wanted to question her about the two videotapes that you had found on the phone. Yes. Yeah. Overall. Yes. The detective is in full, like, crossing her arms mode. And the prosecution is objecting to everything. Wow. And you agree, in your opinion, the video, the two videos, and the autopsy were inconsistent with the story she had given you in the, in the squad car the day before. Overall. The videos, I'm sorry. I mean, the videos was inconsistent with the statement she had given you the day before. What was the statement Sarah said? He got into the suitcase and I thought it would be funny to zip him up. And the video is him saying, okay, Sarah, get me out, get me out. So I don't know if the video is uh, particularly inconsistent with her statements. Repeat your question one time. I forgot. You would agree that the autopsy results 
and the videos that were extracted or taken from her phone. Okay. Uh, recording George. Those two pieces of evidence from your investigation were inconsistent with the mm -hmm. statement that she had given the day before in your squad car. Same objection for the record. Overall. Relevant. Yes. I don't think and I believe that's ultimately okay. the reason you arrested her because of her no. inconsistencies. Objection. No. Sustained. She arrested her because she was on video zipping him up and laughing about it, I believe. Now, you said you had a chance to review the interrogation video at the uh, Orange County Jail on February 20, 25th of 2020. The Orange County Sheriff's Office. I'm sorry, the Orange County, Orange County Sheriff's Department. And also, uh, I believe the state attorney had it transcribed. Have you had a chance to read the transcript? I have not read the transcription. I listened to, I watched the video with the audio. Okay. Have you had a chance to look at my motion where the question and answers are typed out um, at least the first minute or so? No, I have not looked at your motion. Okay. <laughs> um, so like you're do you recall, to me. Um, I don't know who you are. You're saying to her, I'm going to have you sit in the green chair. Yeah, you're going to sit right there. Recording. He's right. Okay. Objection sustained. Okay. Um, do you agree prior to reading Miranda that you mentioned to her that you had received his autopsy and that you were going to read her her rights again, but that we had to talk about that, referring to the autopsy. Best evidence. Sustained. What was the objection? Do you recall making some... What was the objection? Because that is exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. She said, you're going to sit there, and we're going to have to talk about this. We literally just watched that. Where is it? Oh, that's after, okay. Just like we <coughs> uh, Okay, let's just wait a second. She says, you're gonna sit in the green chair. Uh, we got the autopsy results. I'm gonna read your mirror in the rides because we just have to talk about that. I'm gonna have you sit. The green chair at the move. Okay. Appreciate you coming in. Yes, ma'am. So I appreciate no, you coming I'm in, fine. right? You're not under custody. You're not under arrest. I'll be using it. We have a moment. Sure. Um, so obviously, um, he received his autopsy. So I'm going to read you your rights again because I, we have to talk about that. And since I'm talking about the incident, we just have to do it, just like we did yesterday. We just have to just do like it. Yesterday. Remember, I read you the rights. You're right. Okay. So then, what is the objection? Let me see. One, seventeen. Okay. So the objection. Of the sheriff's department not to ask any preliminary questions prior to reading Miranda rights. Same objection for the record. Overruled as relevance. You would have to show me the policy that you're referring to, but I was not asking her any incriminating questions during that time. I was explaining to her yes, you the purpose of the interview. Well, have you ever been, tr you, I, I, under, I understand you must have. Under so he's saying you shouldn't have made any comments such as we just have to talk about it because I have the results for the autopsy. And then Sarah says, just like yesterday protocol, she's like, yeah, we just have to talk about it. So. He's saying that, okay? The detective is saying, okay, I was just explaining to her why we were there. But now he's going to get very um, attacky, if that's a word, where he's going to be like, did you get any training? Have you ever done anything in your life to learn anything? Do you know anything at all? We've done some training on Miranda rights he's gonna and be how mad. to interrogate somebody. Improper. Sustained? Improper, because he's attacking her. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? Uh, since 2013. How long have you been a homicide detective? Over six years. Okay. Have you ever been 
trained or told <laughs> Have to ask or not to ask any statements or any questions prior to reading Miranda relating to them talking to you? Sustained. That's, that's actually relevant. I think that she should answer if she's ever been, but look at her, her, her aggression, aggression face right now. But it is relevant to know if she was trained, like are you, that you're not supposed to say anything. You're just supposed to say, hey, I'm going to read your rights. Then you start with any relevant information, not, hey, sit over there. We got the autopsy and we just have to talk about it. We just have to. Can you tell us if you recall saying anything to her prior to reading her Miranda? I recall talking about, briefly talking about getting the autopsy results. And I wish to have a conversation with her. Right. Do you recall again uh, reading her Miranda rights to her on video? Yes. Do you recall again omitting uh, question number nine on the standardized Miranda rights form for the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Section problems. Overruled. I did not ask her question number nine. Okay. Do they have do they have a Miranda cards form in the interrogation room? So she did not ask, understanding these rights, do you understand these rights that I just read to you? She did not ask, understanding these rights, do you still wish to speak to me? So you would have got you would have had that on your person? What is going on with the sounds? What are you guys doing over there in court? Let me press forward. Okay. Yes, this is our waivers and affidavits. Is that filled out of waivers and affidavits? It's filled out by me, but there's something highlighted that I did not do. Okay. And, um, that form filled out as it relates to civil We're talking about Oh, so you have a form saying that you have given her the disclaimer and she waived it? Is that is that what we're talking about here? Is this top, right? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. It does it what? Does that form is it filled out as it relates to Sarah Lynn? In case, yes. Is that her signature or what? Yes. Did you see her sign on it? Yes. Is that your signature below? Yes. And is that the consent for the phone? The consent to search, yes. On that form, is there also the warning warnings? Yes. That, that is a form that's uh, standardized by the Sheriff's Department? Yes. And you did not re read a Miranda from that, from those rights? From this piece of paper? Yes. That's audio and video recorded, that, no. Okay, you would agree that uh, there's nine questions on that one? Yes. Same objection to the relevance. As far as it being a consent to search her phone, we're not disputing that she was in custody on February 25th, 2020, when she gave a statement to the detectives. And again, under the case law, there's no requirement for this question. So you're not disputing that she was in custody, but she was interrogated before she was placed under custody. And I think the defense attorney is not uh, hitting this uh, point enough because everybody understands that she was under arrest, arrest on the 25th, but she was under arrest at the end of the interview where she actually said, I want a phone call. Do I have the right to a phone call? That was the first thing she said in like 10 seconds. Denying under any state case law regarding the Florida uh, state constitutional right to not com be compelled to testify against oneself, nor any federal or state case law regarding the United States Constitution, the Fifth Amendment applied to this state through the 14th Amendment 
that requires that question to be read. It does not go to the totality of the circumstances of the voluntariness of her uh, waiver of her Miranda rights. Your response? Judge, uh, you know, obviously we, we disagree. You know, you well, then where's the case that supports that? Wow. Because relax, as I addressed judge, previous. Relax with the attitude. I don't like it. I don't like anybody having an unfair position. And it's like, judge, where is the law? Like, don't mistreat the defense attorney because you don't like the defend the defendants. Obviously, I read all the authorities. I mean, State versus Owens. He has zero tolerance. State v. Thomas, Powell from the United States Supreme zero Court, tolerance. which reversed the Florida Supreme Court decision. I'll talk about what's required by Miranda. And that question number nine that you're focusing on isn't included in any of those. Uh, I understand that, Judge. It's the right to remain silent, the right press, to an attorney, judge, let before and after questioning. If you can't afford one, one will be provided to you. Have you understand? Everything you say can and will be used against you. Those are the things that Miranda highlights. That Miranda opinion itself says that. So what does question number nine have anything to do with those things if the state case law and the federal case law, including, including but not limited to Miranda itself and Powell? And then the state case law of Thomas and Owens, all of which were provided either by yourself or by the state. Identify what's required, and that's not one of the requirements. She has a duty. So the so judge has zero tolerance, right? And he's pretty much saying, this is the case law. Identify the case law where I can actually listen to you. And then instead of identifying it, the defense attorney is like, you know, she has a duty. She has a duty, judge. Your Honor, she's, supp she's supposed to be better than this. She's supposed to be better than this. And that is not going to cut it with this judge. Read the room, Mr. Owens. The judge has zero tolerance. The rights, but they were. I want to finish my argument. Okay, there you go. She has Good a duty. For you. Good for you to speak for your speak up for yourself because the judge has been very, very aggressive towards Mr. Owens. It's not his fault that Sarah Boone had ha, has had eight attorneys. It's not his fault that she recorded herself, you know, laughing about her her incident. Uh, so good for you, Mr. Owens, to say, I would like to speak. I would like my argument heard. Okay. So relax. Take a breath, judge. To read the rights. She has an obligation to ensure that the person understands that their rights and they want to waive it. Sarah Boone understands her rights. Yes. Sure. By asking that question. Do you understand the rights I've just read? Why didn't she do that? And then there must be a waiver. Yes, I understand the rights, and I agree to speak to you now. So there for that be waiver, to yes. be freely and voluntarily given, that statement, there must be a conscious waiver of the rights. The problem with the detective is she reads oh. the rights. Do you understand the rights? And then she goes right into questioning. Don't say the problem with right the into detective, question. you know. Without Don't say the problem with the detective because... Then you're going to go back to the, te the detective and ask her questions. And guess what? She's going to be like, screw you, sir. You just said the problem with the detective. Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm not going to help you in any way. Without saying, do you agree? The problem with the situation, Judge, is that Sarah wasn't fully understanding what was happening. To speak to me. Understanding your rights, do you agree to speak to me now? That goes directly to whether or not it was freely voluntarily and knowingly given the statement and whether that waiver was. So under the totality of the circumstances, I think that evidence is relevant. It's the policy of the Sheriff's Department. Obviously, has, she had an old Miranda rights form, but she failed to read what we perceive as a critical question. And she's going to testify about what she perceived at the time. When? Today? That the detective oh. failed to read that question and how it ties into the case. Um, I understand that all I have to read is those four, but I think uh, under the totality of the circumstances standard nice that this court has to apply, <laughs> Look at the court. That, that should be a consideration the court should consider. I know it was an honest mistake. She had an old card. It wasn't a mistake. But it's still, not obligated to say I it. I feel like it should be considered in your decision. Anything else, Mr. J? It's essentially the defendant stating that they want to make new case law. I'm going to sustain the objection as relevance by virtue of 
the decisions in uh, Thomas 351 Southern 3rd 197 and Owens 41 Southern 3rd 352. There's, um, I just, it's not relevant as to what the questions need to be asked for the purposes of whether a sufficient Miranda waiver was given. I think that if Sarah was representing herself, uh, pro se, right, is how they call it, that the judge wouldn't be able to have this type of uh, demeanor because I think that he would be more concerned about uh, appeals and her rights if she was representing herself. Now, because she has an attorney now, they're just, um, how do you say it? They're just like dumping every frustration they have accumulated in the past four years into this attorney that just got here. He's like, I just got here, guys. The judge's like, we've been living here for four years and we don't like it. We want out and your defendant, your uh, client is the reason for our disturbance and you're going to get it because we dislike this whole situation. We don't want to live here anymore. We want a holiday. And, you know, even at the end of this uh, motion, the judge says, well, tomorrow is a holiday or whatever. Like the court is closed, but I will be working. Like, I'm not happy about this. I'm not happy about any of this, but I feel bad for the defense attorney because it's not his fault, you know? It's not his fault. Be nicer, Judge. Be nicer. Do you agree, Detective, that after you read her those Miranda rights? What happened? It froze? After you read her the Miranda rights? You would agree the situation on the 25th when you were reading her Miranda and about to question her was different from the situation the day before. Yes, because the day before she was Miranda free to leave. Yes, I had more evidence. Yes, and you knew she wasn't going to be free to leave. Why that was without the that? autopsy. That was without the two videos from her phone. Correct. In the squad car. Yeah, I did, at the time of the interview. Yes. Yeah. And in the squad car, she was free to leave. Correct. I mean, I didn't tell her she was free to leave, but, but I mean, she, if she was. didn't want to talk to me. She didn't have to talk to me. Okay. But she was free to leave because she left. You didn't arrest her. Don't, don't, don't pretend to be stupid if you didn't do anything wrong. Okay, let me fast forward this. He's going to continue right now. Come on, Mr. Owens. What's up with the papers? State, you may call your next witness. No additional witnesses. Oh, wait, that was it? Let State, me, let me just right, can this witness be released? No. I, I like you to stay. All right, subject to recall. Thank you. So the state doesn't have witnesses, and now the defense is going State, to you call, call your next Sarah witness. Boone. No additional so, witnesses. Let's go to that one and see what Sarah has to say. Sarah has shackles uh, in her, uh, around her waist. She has, she has handcuffs and I do believe she has some feet restraints as well. One of her requests is to have all of that removed for trial. She wants some makeup and regular civilian clothes as well. Let's see her testimony now. Ma'am, you've already been sworn. Counselor, you may proceed. Ma'am, would you please state your full name? Sarah Boone. Well, you're going to have to speak up or move the mic. Sarah Boone. Yes. Infamous Sarah Boone. Florida woman. Where are you currently housed? At the Orange County Corrections Department. Have you been there since February the 25th of 2020? Correct. Was that the date of this interrogation that we're here for on this motion? Why are you screaming? Right. Let me take you back. Let me turn it down. To the morning of finding George Torres in the suitcase. Where you left him. You called 911? Is it true that uh, 
Detective or Deputy Kayla Rodriguez of the Sheriff's Department arrived. Yes. What mental state did you have at that time? I was very confused. Um, it was very hazy. I didn't understand the monumental amount of people that were there and what they were doing with taking things from my home. I was worried about my dogs. Um, I was worried about my son. I was, I was in shock. I was traumatized by the situation and then trying to focus on everything that was going on, on my, at my home. Um, I was hung over. I was still, I believe, intoxicated to a degree. Objection, Judge, move to strike. This is outside their motion to suppress. They have not made any allegations that her statement was involuntary because of her mental state or state of intoxication. Respond. So this is the crux of the problem, right? This is where the main defense lied or should have lied in the beginning. Uh, and where when we were studying her but her behavior during the full interrogation and determined that she may have some narcissism or a lot of it, it, it is because she kept denying about the alcohol. She kept saying, I don't drink. I don't drink that much. I only drink a little bit because George drinks. I don't have a problem with alcohol. I don't like to lose my wits about me. And she kept telling the interrogators that, that she didn't have a problem with alcohol. I actually think I can get a video here from my computer where she is saying that. And the problem is that would have been her best defense at the time, right? The, her best defense would have been, um, let me see, it would have been, I blacked out. I blacked out would have been her best def defense, right? Let's see this. I never said that I was drunk. So I never said I was drunk. It was real quick. Oh, I never said that I was drunk. Okay, but then there's several other little little snippets of her denying that, denying about the drink. Uh, let me see. I don't think I have a very specific one that I can put here, but that's okay. So now that she has a defense attorney that actually is trying to help her, that actually is trying to put a defense for her, the first thing they talked about was, you're going to say you were under the influence, you didn't understand, you're hazy, you're confused, because it's all true. This is all true. She's clearly confused. She's clearly under the influence the next day. First thing she says, I need a water. I need a cigarette. I need to do this. I don't want to get up. I'm dizzy. She's detoxing from alcohol. She drinks probably a lot more than what she has um, disclosed to everybody. And that would have been a great help for her defense. I don't know if it would have made a huge difference, but I blacked out. I have no idea. I have a problem with alcohol. I'm an alcoholic. Something like that, okay? But she keeps telling the interrogators at the, the detectives during the interrogation, I don't like to lose control. I didn't drink that much. I like to keep control. I like to have my wits about, my, about me and to know what's going on. So then now, four years later, right, when she never claimed this before, she comes in front of the court with her ninth attorney and says, I was very confused. I was probably still under the influence. And the prosecutor jumped out of his seat and said, objection. No, 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 no. She has never disclosed anything about her mental state. And she's not about to start now, your honor. So let's everybody... Make a guess. Please put a comment down below. What do you think the judge is going to say? Do you think the judge is going to let her use this? Thoughts? Judge, we're talking about, I'm, I'm just getting some preliminary information. We're, we're, her interrogation is the next day. The state has an obligation, and the case law cited by the state requires specificity in the motions. Look at the so it's not tone. a game of 20 questions and a surprise. 
Okay, this this is the day you, before the interrogation. I understand that. We're not we're not talking about any toxic. Are you going to be arguing anything in conclusion as to what happened on February twenty fourth led to any coercive or coercion behavior on behalf of the Orange County Sheriff's Office on February twenty five? Are you going to bootstrap or link any of those things together? Yes. The interrogation in the squad car and what was said to her prior to getting in the squad car that relates to what she said about it being routine protocol. Yes. Right, I'm going to sustain the state's. Objection. Of course you are. Relating to the intoxication? Yes. Okay. It wasn't raised in any of the three motions that have been filed. Judge, I didn't ask her that. She volunteered. Well, I understand it. Okay. Objection sustained okay. and stricken. Well, Did we you heard it. Speak to the deputy about what had happened. <sighs> yes. Okay. And then. And. Okay, I do believe, just sorry to pause again, but I do believe the judge and the estate are correct because they are supposed to disclose everything, but there is no need for the attitude, the the the, the attacking tone, you know, that the judge is speaking, that the judge is using to speak to the attorney and also the prosecution's tone, like, kind of like we are a team against you guys and screw you and you know, we're not even going to have it, the minimal respect to to hear you. Uh, it's very hard to watch, in my opinion. But I understand the fact that they, they want to leave this out. That's her own fault. She didn't ask for an attorney. She didn't want counsel at the time. She thought she could get away with it. And this is a big lesson for everybody. You know, uh, even when you don't do anything wrong, I do believe that you always should have the right to have an attorney if you're going to be interrogated because at the end of the day nobody's going to help you after you know so your your counsel is going to direct you like what you can do to protect yourself and i do believe that she you know she this is a clear cut case that she did kill george uh, i don't think she intentionally killed george i think she was definitely blackout she you know hasn't has had an unhealthy life she probably has alcoholism she probably could have asked for help a while ago, didn't do it. Uh, alcoholism is a disease. It's not a uh, matter of moral torpitude. It doesn't mean that she's a bad person because she's an alcoholic, but the alcoholism led to the worst case scenario, which is when you are, you know, you affect somebody, killing, you kill somebody or you kill yourself or you cause harm because of your drinking. And that is what happened to Sarah Boone. So she's in this unfortunate situation. But if she had had asked for the attorney, tried to get counsel, she could have been looking at uh, negligent manslaughter or a, a, a smaller charge than a second degree murder. Asked to stay on scene. By both, yes. By both detectives, yes. Okay, how long did it take the detectives to arrive? after you had spoken initially with Deputy Rodriguez? It was not right away. I don't know specifically, but it was not quickly. Okay. Did the detective, the two detectives, when they arrived, did they take over the investigation? Um, it was my understanding, yes. No foundation for her to include anything. Sustained. At, at some point, were, were the detectives directing you what to do and where to go? Okay. Can you explain what the detectives told you as it relates to you getting in the, in the car? What, was the phone issue before the car? Yes. Sustained. Was the, let, me, let me ask you about the phone. When were you first asked about your phone? From my remembering, it was once they arrived, one of the first questions that Hope Salt asked me was if I owned a phone. And what did you tell her? I told her it was on the kitchen counter. All right. And what happened next as it relates to the phone? Um, I believe that it was brought to her with someone else. I don't remember. Sustained. What was the next thing that you were told or talked to about as it relates to the phone? Unlock it. Who told you that? Detective Coxell. I don't doubt it. She handed it to me and I, I don't it. doubt it that the detective said unlock it because remember how the detective said she was going to go talk. We're going to go to my car to talk now. We're going to talk now, right? The next day we got to talk. We just have to, 
So I don't doubt that the detective used those words, unlock it. I don't doubt. And that is a, another problem because of the authority, because, you know, these detectives are so used to, to having that authority that sometimes they don't bother to follow the rules uh, precisely, right? That they don't, they, they, they don't really care that most of them, I, I want to say most of them don't really care to protect the rights of the civilian that much. They care to get the conviction. They care to do their jobs. Uh, and that is a demonstration of it. We're going to go here to talk now. We just have to talk. We just have to, or here, unlock it. Right. Instead of saying, we're going to obtain a warrant to look at your phone or we would like to ask you some questions. You don't have to talk to us. Do you understand? Do you want to waive that right? Do you want to talk to us anyways? You know, it's just small things. Okay. How do you unlock your phone? Um, it was uh, with a passcode. Okay. She's like, I missed and my phone. It, I missed my she, phone. Did she, did you I it thought I was going to get my the, phone the that day. I did. All right. Did you ever see the phone again? After that incident, uh, was the next time you were spoken to by Detective Kopsel was in relation to the interview in the squad car? Yes, she told me I needed to go with her and Detective Lowen to her unmarked vehicle. And did she tell you anything about what was going to take place once y'all got inside the vehicle? That she was just going to be asking me general questions. All right. Was there ever any mention about normal protocol? Not that I can recall. Okay. What about once you got in the squad car? I don't recall the squad car. Okay. And that was recorded for the court to consider. And so she read you your Miranda rights? Yes. All right. Oh, sorry. Did you answer the questions? I did. Did they ever indicate to you that you were a suspect? No. No. Nope. Did they ever indicate to you that you were a person of interest? No. Did they ever they refer known, to the video uh, videos that you recorded on your phone from the night before? No. Were you ever questioned about those videos at the scene? I was not. She was like, I didn't even know why you recorded it. They finished inter interviewing you in the unmarked vehicle. Were you allowed to get out? Yes. Were you allowed to leave the scene at that point? I was instructed by those to not. Okay. And how long did you stay on the scene? The entire time. How long How long was that? How long did it take before the investigation was completed? I was drunk. I don't know. Okay. At some point, did they all leave? Yes. And at some point, did they tell you they were finished with the work there at the scene? Yes. Okay. What did you do? I went inside my apartment and gathered a few things, and then I went to my former husband's residence where my son was located. All right, and how far was that away? About five minutes. How did you get there? I drove. Okay. Drunk? What was the reason that you wanted to stay over there the night? Because I was terrified of his family. All right. Now, later that evening, and they you were, were probably terrified of you, your Sarah. And with your ex-husband? Correct. And did you do that? I, my son, yes. All right. Later that evening, did you attempt to contact Detective Kopsel? I did. And whose phone did you use? Former husband, Ryan Bowe. All right. You said your phone had been seized? Correct. And you had consented to that? You signed a form allowing them to take the phone? Yes. Have there been any discussion about... Returning the phone. Um, Hopeful told me she or Lowen or both would return back to my apartment to return my phone. And when did they tell you this? Before they left the scene. Okay. And did they tell you they would return your phone where? Um, to myself at the apartment. And is that what you understood they were going to do? Yes. I find Was that hard to believe. talk about you coming to the sheriff's department? That I don't know. I mean, that would be very, very... That would be a lot of trickery because the detective would have been like, okay, we're taking the phone. The detective knows this is evidence now, right? So the detective would tell Sarah, oh, Sarah, we're going to come back and return your phone here. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that part. The day of this event. No. 
All right, so later that evening, you borrowed your ex-husband Brian Boone's phone and made a phone call. How did you know Detective Copesell's private cell number? She gave it to me before she left the scene. Okay. And did you call I believe her? that. I did. I also believe you that. What time you called I believe it was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock. And that would have been wow. on February the 24th of 2020? Who did? Yes. Sarah Boone. What? All right. Can you tell us why you were calling her that night? Before she left and giving me her personal cell phone number, um, she told me if I were to recall anything or if I just wanted to talk to her about something regarding the case. Let's just hang out. Her. So I took that to heart and felt very uneasy about how they left the scene. Sustained. Go ahead. No, sustained. Um, there's no pending question at this time. Okay. You, you she were, understood. You were concerned about the case and you wanted to call her? Yes. And did you did you talk to her? Yes. What did you say to her? I told her in all honesty that I felt that she was trying to trick me. I doubt that she said that because she didn't she didn't realize the trickery until she was arrested. So I doubt that she said that did to the you detective. Have a conversation about your phone. Um yes. I asked her answer. What? You may answer the question, ma'am. So did you call for a yes or no? She said yes, and now I don't know like what's pending and how to object. All right. Did y'all have a discussion about objection. your phone? Yes. Can you elaborate on that discussion? <laughs> she told me that I needed to come down to the sheriff's department because she was pregnant and asked me if I remembered about when I was being pregnant. And it would just be a lot easier for her if I were to arrive at the sheriff's department to pick up my phone. Was there any discussion about you being interrogated at the sheriff's department? Was your understanding the sole purpose of you going to the sheriff's department the next day was to pick up your phone? Yes. And the sole reason for the change in plans from them bringing the phone to you was because Detective Copsell was, was pregnant, pregnant. Not, well. right. not because you're going to be under arrest. So the next afternoon, did you drive to the sheriff's department? That was her last free step. Tell us when you parked your car, where you went, what happened? I parked my car and... Um, left everything as regular in my car and um, walked through the front door and uh, went to the window asking um, who I needed to see. And they, I guess, rang um, them upstairs and Detective Lowen came downstairs. And I thought I was supposed to be picking my phone up over at a particular window. And he says, no, your uh, phone is upstairs. So we would just like you to come upstairs. And that's where you can pick up your phone. And get your handcuffs. All right. And so did he escort you upstairs? He did. How did y'all get upstairs? In an elevator. By foot. We walked and one he, foot in front of the other. What was he wearing? Um, I believe he was wearing a red shirt um, along with his firearm and black pants. His firearm was on his, on his waist? The entire time, yes. Okay, so y'all got off the elevator. Where did you go from there? Um, he brought me into a small room, um, and they had me sit down. And then from there, I had a list of things that I was going to ask them that I might need to do or that I could do. Okay, so from the elevator. Okay, let's just see Le what Sarah Boone's list of things were. Her questions. Uh, let's see what Sarah Boone had on her mind. Uh, after this whole police interview, let me see when she picks up her little list. Uh, first, she gives her DNA. Uh, let me see here. Where's her list of things? That's the arrest. I know she wanted to know if she could have the ring back that George was wearing because she bought the ring. Let me see. When does she have? Well, I, our, yes. oh, like, here how do I find out what's what, how many, like what's been found? What is be released. Nice. Uh, how do you guys suggest me finding out about funeral? So that is her oh, list. Yeah, the suitcase, but then she said. 
Other than this. Other than this video that I clearly. How to do this? Because I, so that's what I was going to ask you. So are you all updating his parents today or when he gets final, whatever? So her questions are like, who is paying for the funeral? Are you guys going to tell his parents? His parents do not like me. They always say this was going to happen someday. <laughs> she, clueless, right? What does it matter? Why? Uh, what we tell his parents, maybe. So the because, detective, what does it matter? I don't like her her demeanor either here. There's, a, there's not a whole lot of conversation that goes on after that. Got it. Perfect. So I don't know if I asked you guys or how I find this out other than talking to his parents, which is not going to happen. Yeah, probably terrible idea. Yeah, it's not going to happen. What? How do you guys suggest me finding out about funeral? Yeah. That's not even something that's been probably talked about between the family. That's not something we ask. We have no way of. I know. didn't know, so I'm asking. Yeah. So it'll be up to them to make their arrangements of what they want to do. Like she just told you. Yeah, you're not married. So last night, I'll pretty much be willing to wager that they have not even considered what they're going to do. My okay. body can't even be released. No. So yes. I've been there with parents, grandparents, and uncles. Um, so. I don't know if I have the right to or not, but like I was going to call his former employees whom he really cared for and let them know. You can okay, whatever. Call you want. I just don't want to do something that I'm not supposed to. You're not supposed um, to go somebody. How do I go about getting his uh, wedding ring? Okay. Wedding ring. So that's what she really wants to ask, right? How do I get his wedding ring? So first she tries to fluff the questions a little bit. What do we do about the funeral? Who's going to tell his parents? Can I tell his like friends and his boss? And then she's like, what about the ring? I want the wedding ring. Is that the medical examiner's office? It'll come to us eventually. No, and then it'll, it'll be released to, oh, to, to the, the next weekend. Yeah, okay. I bought it for him. That was a civil issue. <laughs> I bought so it for him. As long as it goes to them, they're the ones that are going to release it. We don't have any say in that. So I won't get that back. No, you won't get that back, Sarah. You won't get any of it back because you're going to, unfortunately, you know, you're going to be in prison, darling. So you're not going to get that back. But those were the questions that Sarah had for the detectives. No one escorted you directly into the interview room. And we've got we've got the recording, the audio and the video. Yeah, we, we've seen uh, it. Yeah, we have it right here. Else. Check out playlist, Sarah Boone. Part of that time. Was there any discussion that you made outside, any discussion between you and either detective uh, about anything the phone questioning anything before walking into that room no. okay so direct directly off the elevator and walked into the interrogation room okay. and then we've got the video on that now you know i've watched the video oh yeah Correct? we've and watched it too the where i've referred to the question where she asked you to sit down You recall that happening? Yes. Yes. Did that refresh your memory watching the video? She recalls it, so she doesn't need any refreshing. But okay. Do you recall her saying that she had received the autopsy? Yes. Yes. Do you recall her saying, I want to read you your rights again because we have to talk about that, referring to the autopsy? Yes. Yes. This was prior to you being read your Miranda rights. Correct. And she also said, we're not done talking about the incident. You recall that? Yes. And then she said, we just have to do it. Yes. How did that make you feel? Doesn't matter. Objection, yeah. Were you trying to comply with the officer's demands? Overall. In every way. Were you trying to cooperate? I believe so. Were you polite with them. Doesn't matter. <laughs> what happened happened. What had happened had happened. You said just like we did yesterday. Protocol. And then you said normal protocol. Yes. Is that what she had said the day before? Yes. What do you mean? Normal protocol. Yes. That she had she said the same word. Could you you said normal protocol? To her. I was reiterating to her what she had said to me the day before. Yes. Very good. When she said, we got the autopsy, sit over there. We just have to talk. We just have to. And then Sarah's like, oh, okay, nor normal protocol. Just like, you know, yesterday you said it was normal protocol. But Sarah was allowed to leave. Not today. 
So it was not going to be normal. To you. Except number nine. Except number nine. Oh. She read the rights, and then she said, do you understand Sarah's what like, I just read to you? And you agreed that you had. Yes. But you were not asked if you wanted to waive. Having these rights in mind, do you agree to speak to me now? Overruled. Overruled, yes. Don't ask that question. Is it fair to say that after she read the Miranda rights, and That's after good she for her said, appeal. do you understand the rights that I've just read to you, that she read right into the question? She did. So she never got the answer from you. Do you agree to speak to us now? I was never asked that. Interesting. Sarah is finally realizing how important it was for her to have an attorney this whole time and how she messed up by talking so much. Let's go, Mr. Owens. We don't have all day. The way that she acted, the things that she said. Mm -hmm. The fact that they had your phone. Did you get did you get the impression you were not getting your phone back if you nope. didn't answer the questions? Sustained. She was in custody. She was not in custody. Yeah. She was not in seated by the state. Ah, in their response, that it was a custodial interrogation. Okay. But she wasn't aware of it. Right. She wasn't aware she was in custody. What does her subjective perception matter? Oh, so it doesn't matter that she's not aware? This is what the judge, I was very curious to know about this. So the judge says, what does subjective, subjective knowledge matter? So it doesn't matter that she knows that she's in custody? before she's interrogated? Well, under the circumstances, it would matter. I mean, she she didn't feel she was free to leave. It, it, she was in an enclosed small space. Um, she was- That all goes to whether or not- she, I mean, Relax. She was being Josh. questioned by two lead detectives, homicide detectives. One of them was wearing a firearm. Um, of course. She was trying to cooperate as best she could. I think her- her position is that she was coerced in yes. answering the question. What does that have to do with coercion? Those all factors that under Ramirez as to whether or not it was custodial. Well, I got to look at I mean, Ramirez. Some of the factors are whether or not the interrogation actually happens in a police station or not, or whether it happens outside a police station. So just that, just that environment alone, that goes to whether or not it was a custodial interrogation okay. that I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling with the connection on that being non-compliance with Miranda coercion or the third ground of voluntariness. Well, and I think it, it goes subjectively to her and what she was feeling if she had a free choice or not based what's, on what's based the subjectivity on subjectivity matter, excuse me, based what's on subjectivity matter under the case law, based on, based on the circumstances that she was dealing with at the time, whether or not she felt she had a choice, but what does her subjectivity have to do with that? I mean, if it doesn't have anything to do with that, I'm surprised because I think she should have known that she was under arrest, that she was under custody of the police. Because the moment that she found that out, the first question out of her mouth was, "Do I can I have a phone call? Do I have the right to, to, to a phone call? So she could have very well said, uh, what if they didn't have this video of her? What if they didn't have this video of her and all they had was the full interrogation, right? And then... The first thing she says when she's when she's aware she's under custody that she's going to be arrested, I want to call somebody. But before that, she spoke for two hours because she thought she was free to leave. So I think that has a lot to do with everything. I don't know if the case law says that the 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 person is not the the police is not required to tell them you're under custody. Uh, that would be strange for me, but we're going to take a look at this Ramirez uh, case another time. Let's just continue with this interaction here. I, I believe it's relevant. It is relevant. Overruled. I'm sorry, the ejection sustained. I apologize. <laughs> I believe it's relevant too, but he should have a case law to combat that because the judge has zero tolerance for the defense. Did you understand you were not going to get your phone back until you answered the questions? Sustained. 
Did you have some questions for them at the end? I did. Did you feel like you had a choice in answering their questions? Objection sustained. It's like they're working a little team. I, I hate that. Man, that day, you came to the Sheriff's Department to get your phone? Yes. Yes. Did you know that you were going to be placed in custody? I did not. Did you know that you were going to be arrested? I did not. Did you know that you were going to be questioned? I did not. Were you trying to cooperate with law enforcement based on her statements that you have to talk to us? Yes. No rule. Were you there answering her questions because she confirmed that this was normal protocol? That was my understanding, yes. That's all the questions I have. Okay, I think he did a great job. You know, he did the best he could with what he had. And we are clear on the fact that she was not aware she was in the custody and that it seems to the judge that that, that doesn't matter. So let's watch the cross. So that afternoon on February 24th of 2020, when Deputy Kayla Rodriguez arrived at your residence shortly after 1 p.m., you were under the influence of alcohol, correct? Okay, so now the state's opening the door to something they just objected a few moments earlier when they say, oh, she never brought up that she was under the influence. She never brought up that she was uh, confused. So now he's saying, so you said you were under the influence, right? Yes, she could have even said, I was very confused and now I was not sure what's going on. You were impaired by alcohol, correct? Yes. I don't know as much as Okay. And that was consumption from the night before, correct? Yes. Yes. So you did not go to brunch that morning and have mimosas or anything else to drink. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. You're you so funny. On your home that morning, correct? She could have. So does that affect in any way your memory when you testify about the events that transpired Say between yes. you and Detective Copesel that afternoon? Say yes, probably. Yes. One more time, please. Did the alcohol have any effect on your memory of what happened? I'm not a doctor, but Copes probably. That afternoon? Now or then? then? Then. Probably. Say yes. Did alcohol affect my conversation with her? Your memory. There's a jury instruction that says a witness's memory and perception is pertinent. And I'm asking you, did the alcohol that you were under the influence of affect your memory or perception Say of yes, the events Sarah. that you testified to today that you said happened on that oh, afternoon that's a of very February long 24th, thing. 2020? Very complicated question. So did they affect? Did the alcohol affect your memory? Yes. My answer? Your memory. He doesn't yeah, clarify. I don't. Yeah. Okay. It's been asked three different yeah. So we'll leave it at you were under the influence of alcohol that afternoon, correct? Yes. I think she, I think she said she didn't know what. She, she said that she had alcohol under the influence or impaired. The objection is uh, the court does not entertain speaking objections. Mm -hmm. The legal grounds need to be provided. What are the legal grounds of your objection? I know that she. She said she didn't know what, it what are the legal was. grounds of your objection? Uh, All right, you may proceed. Oh, poor guy. I feel so bad for him. He couldn't, he couldn't understand. He couldn't come up with the legal grounds. Let me think about a legal ground real quick. Uh, so he's asking her, did the alcohol impact your memory? Then he said, did it, were you impaired? Then he said, were you under the influence? So he's asking a bunch of different questions, right? So uh, I would say objection compound, right? Ask one question, objection compound. Uh, too many questions, too much confusion. But Mr. Owens has been so beaten during this motion hearing, so attacked, so spoken to with like so much aggression that he was like, I'll withdraw my objection, Your Honor. Understand that you're charged with second degree murder in this case, correct? Yeah. You're facing a potential penalty of life in prison, correct? Do you understand that the score sheet minimum is probably about 22 and a half years? What? I don't know. Okay. Okay. What does and that have to do with anything? It is 
your desire to have these statements oh, excluded from the jury's gotcha. uh, consideration, correct? Judge. It's not her desire, it's the attorney's motion. The objection. Your intent is to testify differently than you have testified in the statements. I don't know how I'm going to testify. One, I'm not correct? there yet. It's in the future. I would object to that. I'm not on speculation the question. Mr. J. Judge, um, a witness's bias is always at issue when they take the stand. And it's our position that um, her credibility for all the things that she has testified to today, that particularly the all things the in things conflict say, with all Detective Copes' testimony, and the court, of course, in a motion to suppress has to consider the credibility of the witnesses. And you are in the best position to do that. The appellate courts are going to be very deferential to you. It's our position that she's biased. She is charged with second degree murder. She's facing life in prison. Based on the uh, examination that both state attorneys and defense counsel and the state's expert uh, witness today, it is the state's belief that she is intending to testify differently than she testified. How do you have this belief? What is your evidence for that belief? Objection, speculation. How do you have this belief? You're not there yet. You don't know how she's going to testify. You don't know if she's going to testify differently. Okay. Is she biased? Yes. Does that mean she wasn't impaired? No. Does that mean that she understood that she was waiving her rights, that she was going to be under arrest? No. So I'm starting to not like the prosecution already because I understand human nature, right? We have to always remember human nature. And that's why we put this into context. The judge has been here. He's, li he's lived in this courtroom for four years. The uh, prosecution also, right? Sarah Boone has ran their patients out of the room. And now she's like, oh, yes, all meek, all humble. Oh, I'm innocent. Oh, I'm like, uh, I don't understand. I was confused. I was drunk. So they're mad. They're angry. They're coming at her, you know, with all their force. But it's not the defense attorney's fault. And also, they still have the obligation to do it properly. So I don't like it when they try to, you know, you still have to have the arguments. I think Sarah Boone has a very weak case. She, there's a video against her. There's an interrogation against her. She she did it. You know, she did it. We, we have proof of it. We have it on video. Uh, but I still think that the, the trial should be fair and that they shouldn't just be like, okay, let's team up because we're angry about this whole situation. Let's just hang her to dry because it's not going to be good for justice because it's not going to be good if she appeals, which she will, and the appellate court finds actual issues with it. So we'll, we'll see. Right now, I do believe that the fact that she didn't understand she was on the she was in custody during the interrogation. I think that's an issue. The judge doesn't seem to, to think so, but we'll see about that. And the fact that she was under the influence was also an issue, right? Because she wasn't completely able to understand uh, the magnitude of her situation here. Is the appellate court going to reverse anything? I don't think so based on those two because we have the video against her. But if they keep adding these things and, and the and the prosecution and the judge just decide to like go all out against her, that might not be good. So let's continue watching. Right in the statements that she provided to law enforcement in States Exhibit 1, and therefore she is biased in all the things that she's testified about today. Yeah, because it's so what? She's biased. To get this statement, um, all these statements, uh, or the statement on Objection compound. out. Um, so that she is not going it's to be cross-examined, impeached with it, so that she can testify the way that she testified. You don't know afternoon. how she's going to testify. Response. Judge, I agree with the impeachment about being under the influence. I agree with the impeachment about what she's facing, that she may be biased, but yeah. she's facing potentially life in prison. Sure. 22 years on the low end. I, I agree with all that. Oh, it could be 22 um, years. She just got through at the jail uh, meeting with the state's expert who evaluated Sarah Boone. I was present. Uh, the two prosecutors were present. It wasn't recorded. He can't be a witness now if he's going to question her about what was said during that evaluation. And he's putting himself in danger to be a witness down the road. I don't think that's proper cross-examination about what she said there versus 
what you say here. Anyway. Right, like what is she going to testify to? How do you know that? Oh, because during the discovery, you, Mr. Prosecutor, were present during her evaluation with a uh, specialist. And because you heard things, you're like, oh, I think she's going to testify like this. So very good argument by the defense attorney here. Further. Mr. J. I am not specifically asking her what she said that was different. Um, and so obviously, you're assuming if she I will say and, different things. Uh, she testified differently. I would have to accept that answer. There's no way for me to extrinsically uh, impeach her with that due to the brevity of the time frame that we have all been subjected to. Oh, um, we all been subjected to. But I do believe to. it's a fair question to ask her whether or not she intends to testify differently um, than her statements no. that are in States Exhibit 1 and consistently with how she testified this afternoon and that she understands it would benefit her if these statements are excluded. So I'm going to sustain the objection based on how the question was asked. I'll yeah. allow you to revisit it based on how you just explained it to me. Oh, look at the judge giving him <laughs> an out. Uh, statements to an, an evaluator this afternoon, did you not? I did. All right. And without going into the details, um, would you agree that there are some differences in those statements as to what is in the statements you provided to law enforcement on February 25th of 2020? Yes. And you understand that, she wasn't that I would be able to cross-examine you on giving inconsistent statements That's at trial fine. if you take the stand, correct? I understand. And so you understand the benefit of this motion to suppress being granted? Of course. No other questions? All right. Get out of here. Okay. Um, we can have Ms. Boone return back to counsel's table. While she's in the process of returning to counsel's table, anything else further from an evidence or testimony perspective from your side of the ledger? Yes. Okay. Anything else from the state? Okay. So they're going to talk about the the clothing, the makeup, and all of that. And then the judge's going to say, let me see if the judge is going to say tomorrow's a holiday, but I'm going to be here. My soon. And we did talk about that at the jail trial. Mm -hmm. Although it is a court holiday, the court will be working tomorrow. I will See, endeavor. The court, it's a holiday, but the court will be working get tomorrow. Get you written orders on all of these things. No and he denied the motion. The video is in. The, the interrogation is in. The trial is on Monday, October 7th. And we can't wait to watch it. Very interesting psychological profile Sarah has displayed. Uh, we have covered her interrogation here in this channel. Go to the playlist, Sarah Boone playlist, and check out all the videos. I can't wait to see the coverage next week or with you guys. Uh, I may cover the live trial or I may like do it afterwards so that we can cut you know, the breaks, the, the, the long pauses and stuff like that and make a more concise video for you. But I just want to thank you so much for all your comments, all your shares, all your likes, because every single thing you do really helps the channel to grow. And I love spending time with you guys and talking about body language and true crime and observing the amazing psychology of it all and how people are so different and why people do what they do and learning together about the law and also about behavior. So guys, be safe and I'll see you guys on Monday.